very down, though, and I think it's really important that we understand those. Uh, the first one, of course, is, is the jury selection process. Mm -hmm. We have a French term that we use for, for that. It's called voir dire. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of the listeners uh, uh, to this show mm -hmm. have heard of that term before, and, and I think it means to speak the truth mm -hmm. in French. But it's an extensive and intrusive questioning process of it is, yeah. decent, mm -hmm. law-abiding citizens that have been called for jury duty. And they are questioned unmercifully by the lawyers and by the court. Mm -hmm. And they are, many of them, excused from jury duty. Not yeah. voluntarily, not because they're felons, not because they've done anything wrong, but merely because they hold views that may not be uh, agreeable yeah, to that, one of the sides in the case. Yeah, that's the whole thing, yeah. So we still are putting chains on our jury. Yeah. And that isn't the only way we put chains on them. We put chains on them on down farther in the farther trial. The, yeah, like, like uh, the part that I'm familiar with that when I was present at this federal drug trial, um, the, the jury had questions and asked for new instructions because the instructions didn't apply and the judge was in a hurry. He wanted to go, he wanted to go for lunch. He said, I'm sorry, go back and work. So. Sometimes the judges are sort of manipulating juries. That's what I found. Uh, the jury instructions are another way that we mm -hmm. very much control the jury. Uh, in many trials, the trial in New York, for example, recently of the police officers ah. that had killed the, the man in New York. Uh, uh, Mr. Diallo? Diallo. 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 Yes. Yeah, the mm -hmm. Diallo case. There were a mountain of jury instructions. Mm -hmm. And the jury instructions can really force the jury to do, come to certain conclusions exactly. based on certain evidence that they hear. So that's another way we straightjacket the jury. We don't really allow them to use their morality to apply their common sense and their morality to the situation. Uh, another way we straightjacket the jury is right during the mm -hmm. trial itself. You, you may have heard of these things called the rules of evidence. Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. And they are the they are the rules of court, basically, mm -hmm. that the lawyers are compelled to follow. Uh, unfortunately, those rules have one purpose and only one purpose: to manipulate. <laughs> yes, and usually it's it's to keep information yeah. away from the jury. And so, obviously, if you've got juries who are only getting a piece of the story, yeah. you're going to get verdicts that possibly aren't accurate verdicts, or they're not good verdicts because the jury didn't have all the information. Yeah, I found that, I find that to be very true. Uh, can I add something? Yeah, Just, that, uh, that's why I'm looking. <laughs> okay, uh, on a personal note, um, picking up on this, when I went to law school, and I went to law school um, many years ago now, but it was at Boston University in Boston, and we had a professor of evidence called Professor Hecht. And he's teaching the evidence class. And on the very first day, he introduced us to these books called the Rules of Evidence and said, we'll be mainly using the federal rules of evidence, but most states dovetail closely with this. But he says, I want to throw out a theoretical question and a philosophical question. He said, Why do, what do you, the class here, and there may be you know, 50, 60 people in this class, um, what do you think we have the rules of evidence for anyway? Why have the rules of evidence? If you're going to have a trial, and you have this jury here, um, why not let them hear everything? And all the students scratched their heads. And uh, I thought, well, that's a pretty good question. And I didn't know the answer. Mm -hmm. He waited a certain amount of time. And he said, the answer is simple. is because we, the legal establishment, do not trust juries. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying to keep things from them. And this is how it is done. And he says, you, when you become lawyers, you're going to have to learn these rules of evidence and learn how to get things in various ways. And it's all kind of devious and Byzantine, and the language is archaic, and it will depend on the whims of your trial judge whether you get things in or not. Mm -hmm. One judge will let something in that another judge won't. But he says, the bottom line is we don't trust juries. And he says, here's the first rule of evidence. And he says, it really encompasses all the rules of evidence. He said, it is the rule of relevancy. It's the very first one, and it says, and I'll give it uh, verbatim here, it says, all relevant evidence is admissible in trial in front of the jury. 
and all irrelevant evidence is inadmissible. So the jury won't get to hear that. Mm -hmm. And the trial judge makes the decision outside the hearing of the jury. Exactly. He said it's all relevancy, and it will all be the judge's opinion as to what he thinks is relevant. Now, uh, having said that, you think, obviously, if someone is offering a piece of evidence, they must have thought it was relevant. Or they wouldn't have thrown it out. Or, or they wouldn't even offer it. Yeah. Uh, there have been um, some seminars and conferences mm -hmm. and so forth where they'll give a question to a panel of judges, and they'll split on whether this evidence should have come in mm -hmm. or not come in, which tells us that the fact of a piece of evidence coming in or not is often just based on which judge you're getting. It's, exactly. It's mm -hmm. a chance. And there yeah. really isn't any totally, completely right or wrong mm -hmm. call that you can make. So obviously, at least obviously to me in mm -hmm. this situation, the evidence, we should default to having the evidence come in. Yeah. Because the more information that the jury gets, the better decision they can make. It's just like if you run a business or you do any activity, the more you know about what you're doing, probably the better job you're going to do of mm -hmm. doing that. And the jury isn't any different. We just had a local case here, and uh, one of the jurors came to see me by coincidence, uh, you know. And it, it, it's a kidnap case, and um, uh, it involves two brothers. And the gentleman decided not to, not to find this man guilty for a long time, simply because um, they were brothers, and he did no more or less than was expected f of him as the older mm -hmm. brother. And, um, and he thought about the mother, you know, and all the people involved. And, uh, and then at the end, he finally gave in, thinking that if there was a mistrial, then they would introduce some other things, and it would make it worse for that for the man that shouldn't have been charged with a kidnap in the first place. And so that's really sad when um, when you have to even think like a criminal. Like for instance, um, if I leave here today and they say, "Where were you at two o'clock?" Well, I know I was here because it was something that I do on Mondays. Right. But on Tuesdays, maybe I don't remember that. Why do regular people have to think like criminals uh, in case I might, you might get asked that one day? And it really puts a lot of pressure on people. Even a crime like kidnapping, which mm -hmm. I think society recognizes the horrendousness of this mm -hmm. crime, uh, as you pointed out here, there are situations where maybe this crime is charged, mm -hmm. but if all the information comes in front of the jury, there's a reason that the jury should nullify or exactly. they should fail to mm -hmm. uh, strictly apply this law because there's a mitigating reason. There's, there's a good reason, a moral reason, to ignore mm -hmm. uh, the crime, so to speak. Uh, we also see this in situations where people are in, a, in an emergency situation. Exactly. Maybe they're starving and yeah. they steal food or they steal food to feed their families. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, it's a crime to steal. Uh, these laws are good laws, we mostly agree, mm -hmm. but there are situations when the law should be laid aside mm -hmm. and the person's actions are understandable. And while I've got the floor here, there's one uh, word that you use that I'd like to give my own views on. I don't know exactly how Tom feels, but the word mistrial. Uh, in the system, we have uh, s several results. You can have an in a verdict of uh, not guilty, and that means that the person cannot be retried mm -hmm. and they are free. You can have, um, and that would be an acquittal also, same terminology. Uh, then you would have uh, a hung jury. Now, a hung jury means that the jury was not unanimous. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And because they weren't unanimous, Yes, the person goes free, but the state can also come back and retry and them. Mm -hmm. Now, we sometimes apply the term, as you did, mm -hmm. mistrial to that. My perception is this is not a mistrial. There isn't anything amiss that happened. It's the jury performed its function as it should. They were split in their opinion, and because of that, the person was free to go because in our system you have to be unanimously 
guilty. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you have to have the votes of all members of the jury. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we sometimes use that terminology and it, it sheds a little bad light on the jury. Yeah. They didn't do anything wrong. They're doing exactly what a jury should do. And it's totally appropriate that the citizen should be free. And then it is also, if it's a horrendous crime and the prosecutor feels that this should be punished, then they are free to come back and retry person. the person. And mm -hmm. then, of course, the other result we can have is that the person has been unanim unanimously, by all 12 jurors, found guilty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then to get back to this gentleman, for first I want to stop it here. I wanted to say something in between where you were when we talked about crimes of survival, so to speak. Um, there is a writer, his name is Lop Seng Vampa, and most of the friends are familiar with him. He's a Tibetan monk that wrote many books. And he was asked uh, his definition of right and wrong. And he said, it is wrong to steal, so it is right to let your children starve to death. And I wanted to use that to summarize <laughs> it, you know, where you draw the balance here. And I forgot my thought uh, to where I was going with the second part. Uh, I would like to speak to that. That is very rigid, <coughs> and that is what I would characterize as legalistic thinking. You have a principle that kind of looks good on paper, and mm -hmm. you say, well, it's wrong to steal. Mm -hmm. But if you do not allow the freedom and independence of the people, the jury, to look at the individual case, you can have a very wrong result. Exactly. The law in general is right, but in this particular case, mm -hmm. applying the law would be wrong. And interestingly enough, maybe because of jury nullification, and that's what we're talking about. I, I should have uh, identified the subject matter maybe at the very beginning. We're talking about jury nullification, which means the jury's power to nullify the law yeah. in the case in which it sits. It doesn't mean the law is repealed by that case. One case does not repeal a law. But hundreds of jury nullification verdicts acquittal, of acquittal would repeal a law mm -hmm. because the entire society would be moved. The law would be unenforceable, and it sends a message to the legislators to formally repeal the law. And this has happened in our history before. Um, but uh, getting back to the man who was told he can't steal, he's poor, he can't afford food, he can't steal, and he should let his children starve. This is where another legal doctrine comes in called the privilege of necessity. And this is mm -hmm. a doctrine in the law. And it means that uh, you can break the law sometimes if you are actually forced to do it by necessity for a greater good. An example that's a lot of times given is you're out in the wilderness and you lose your way. And there you're starving and freezing and in the wintertime and you come upon a cabin Mm -hmm. in the wilderness. You don't own that cabin, but you look through the window and there's firewood in there, there's food in there, and there may be clothing, it's warm inside, it's locked, nobody's around. You have the privilege of necessity to break into that cabin, to commit a breaking and entering and a trespass. Mm -hmm. You still have to pay for the damage. Mm -hmm. You have to make whole and make right mm -hmm. for the owner, but you cannot be successfully prosecuted, or you should not be under this doctrine, for the crime of breaking and entering. Of breaking in, yeah. See? And here is where I would say the law in its rigidity uh, has a certain symmetrical structure, and that's what looks good to legislators. But what looks good to jurors is doing justice in their case. And if we put the two together, you can have a certain amount of rigidity in law if, and only if, the jurors are free to set the law aside at certain times. Mm -hmm. And this is not a new idea with me. There's a very famous professor, uh, Williston, who wrote the Horn book on contracts. And he says that very thing. The jury, in the privacy of their retirement, with their power over that case, can correct the deficiencies in the law. It is like um, a, a release, a safety valve. The jury is the safety valve of the mm -hmm. community. He says, you just cannot have nothing but rigid laws. If you do, you'll have uh, a cruelty that will invite revolution and chaos. Mm -hmm. You have to have the jury and its power of mercy. And so uh, that's what I think even the Buddhist monk would probably say in his next sentence, in his next breath. Yeah, there was the end of it. He left it open to your imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, probably for this he very did. discussion. Uh, if Excuse I may me. interject something along the lines of what Tom was saying, Within the system, we have the privilege of necessity. Mm -hmm. That is a perfectly legal defense. It's recognized by the system. We have another one that's very much recognized, and that's self-defense. Mm -hmm. Self-defense yeah, yes. means that you have uh, 
preserved yourself basically and in some cases you've you've had to commit what would be usually an assault mm -hmm. or maybe you've even killed